In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 17 through the end of the chapter. Now, many people have said that these are some of the greatest words in all the Bible. In all the Bible. Now, uh, someone said that they believe that uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the greatest single verse that Paul ever wrote. But these are really great verses in the Bible. And so let's read about it in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 17 through the end of the chapter, verse 21. And this reminds us about the Bible doctrine of, um, say, of reconciliation. And let's uh, begin at verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Together now. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, And uh, we'll just zero in on these verses as we study along this morning about the Bible doctrine of uh, justific uh, not justification, but reconciliation. Now, as we study uh, the Bible uh, and we think of human nature and we see what's going on in the world today, uh, everybody knows that there's something wrong in the world today. Not only the United States, but all uh, through the world that there's something really wrong and um, there's something missing, that uh, people don't have it uh, all together when we think about it. And see, everybody knows that there's something missing in people's lives. See, and we realize that, that uh, there's, there's a missing uh, piece in the lives of uh, a lot of uh, people. Now, uh, not only around the world, but especially here in America, because um, we've all heard about this fentanyl crisis in America, where every year, 100,000, whenever the government gives statistics, it's a lot more than that, many, many more than 100,000 die every year. But do you know that's only an American problem? Do you realize that that's not a problem in any other major country of the world? And of course, all that comes from China, and we see that effort to, uh, to, to really mess up Americans. Now, and so well over 100,000 die every year from fentanyl overdose in America. And, um, and not only young people, but a lot of people that are older. So we all know that there's something radically missing in the lives of every uh, person. Now, and everybody talks about it. Everybody knows that's true, that there's something missing in everybody's life. There's a missing piece that, uh, that, that's missing in the lives of uh, many, uh, ma uh, many individuals. And yet, see, nobody has the answer. See, nobody has the answer. What's wrong with Americans? See, what's wrong with the world today? saying everybody has their uh, thinking about it and so forth, but nobody really has the answer to what is wrong and what is a man's problem. Now, see, it seems that, that everybody's really messed up, and yet, again, nobody knows exactly what uh, the answer is or able to put their finger uh, on the answer. Now, uh, what I mean by that, I heard this... Um, uh, one of the, the leading psychologists in America today. And uh, I heard him interviewed for a few minutes on the radio, and uh, he wrote a book recently, and he's talking about all the problems in America. Now, the only problem is he himself 
has a lot of problems. If anybody knows about his personal life, he has a lot of problems, but he's trying to straighten out uh, America. But he said that through his research, and as I mentioned earlier in the Sunday school class, that it's hard to realize uh, what he said. See, he said that everybody or uh, the average person that has a smartphone hits that uh, phone 352 times a day. Now, that's hard to believe. I think that's almost impossible. But in the Sunday school class this morning, I mentioned it, and the folks in Sunday school said, yes, they believe it. Somebody said, I was with somebody recently, and that's all they did was hit that phone. That's all they did was hit that, that phone. Now, um, now, if that is true, and now he wrote it in a book, and he said he did the research, and he said, that's true. 352 times uh, every day a person hits that smartphone. <clears throat> now, again... That's hard to believe, but if it's even half of that, and if he does know what he's talking about, and he's supposed to be an expert in the field, um, that shows nobody is in their right mind today. You cannot be in your right mind and hit your smartphone 352 times a day. So you cannot be a, a, a normal, logical person if that is true in a person's life, you see. And, uh, but so everybody knows there's something wrong in uh, our country and the world, but, uh, but nobody has the answer. Now, the answer is clearly found in the Bible. See, what is wrong with America? What is wrong with the world? Now, and uh, as we study the Bible, we see um, that the Bible uh, specifically has the answer to uh, the question, what's wrong with America, what's wrong with the world? And you see, it all revolves around the Bible doctrine of reconciliation. Now, the Bible doctrine of re reconciliation is a, a neglected Bible doctrine. In most Bible doctrine books, they don't say anything about the doctrine of reconciliation. Now, why, I don't know, because it's a major doctrine in the Word of God. You see, the doctrine of uh, reconcili uh, reconciliation. Now, see, the Bible teaches that everybody, not some people, but everybody is estranged and separated from God. See, now that's the teaching of the Word of God. Say that every person is estranged, alienated from God, and uh, because of that, the Bible teaches man's greatest need is to be reconciled to God. Say man is not reconciled to God. Man is alienated from God. Every person, best person in the world, um, the people who uh, give more to charity than anybody else, every person. Uh, is not reconciled to God. They are alienated and they are separated from God. And that's the real problem in the world today, uh, certainly as we study uh, the Word of God. Now, when you turn to Romans chapter 5, we see here five reasons why every person needs to be reconciled to God. Now, as you turn over there to Romans chapter uh, 5. Now, you see, number one, the Bible teaches in Romans 5, 6. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, see, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, see, number one, the Bible teaches that every person is without strength in order to please God or in order to come into a right relationship uh, with God. See, it's in... Uh, man is incapable, you see, of coming into a right relationship with God or pleasing God. Why? See, the Bible says it's not that we have some strength, but see, Romans chapter 5 and, um, and verse 6, it says here, when we were without strength. What does that mean? See, there's no way we could please God. No human being apart from Jesus Christ has the ability to please God and to come into a right relationship with God. Now, uh, you see, a lot of times you think, well, I have, <clears throat> I have uh, 
uh, some strength. I have a little ability to uh, please God. After all, I'm not the worst person in the world. I've never murdered anybody, uh, and I don't uh, steal or rob. And so we think that we have some strength or uh, some merit build up on our part that will help us to uh, come into a right relationship with God. But you see, the Bible teaches, say, that we're without strength. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, nobody has any strength to save themselves. Now, that's where uh, we differ with religion. See, most religion teaches that if you do good, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and you can please God. If you come to our church, you can please God. If you come to our church, you do good, you'll get to heaven uh, someday. And most churches teach that. See, and they teach that, that man really isn't that bad. You know, just try to live a good life and you will please God. But now you see what Romans 5 and verse 6 says. It says, when we were yet without strength, we have no strength to please God. See, we're totally without strength to please God. Now, see, human nature is addicted, you see, uh, to doing something to merit their salvation. See, everybody has that addiction. And it's an addiction where we think that um, through our merit, we can please God. And that's why people are religious no matter where you go in the world. They have some type of a religion, they have some type of thing that they think they're pleasing God. See, people are addicted to that. See, to the matter of my good works will get me to heaven. Uh, my religion will merit my entrance into heaven. Something like that. And the Bible teaches, see, we have no strength. See, we're alienated from God. We're separated from God. See, we have no strength to save ourselves. Now, as you wrote, uh, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, there's another word here. It says, uh, Christ died, see, for the ungodly. Now, see, that's another thing that Bible, the Bible says is true of you and it's true of me. See, it's true of all of us. See, uh, not only are we without strength, but we are ungodly. See, the Bible says he died for the... Un See, the only person that Jesus Christ can save is an ungodly person. See, and um, he came to uh, call sinners unto uh, repentance. Now, uh, that means that... Um, there's nothing that we can do to please God, and that man does not have reverence towards God. See, man does not revere, <coughs> uh, revere uh, God. See, uh, ungodly means he cannot and is not a person who pleases God. Now, uh, for instance, anybody wants to get saved, and they come and they say, well, you know, uh, I... I I, I can please God with my own life or my own behavior. No, see, we're ungodly. See, now everybody has said this at one time or another, where we've all said that that is uh, an irreverent act. That is a irreverent uh, person. They don't have any respect for God whatsoever. Well, the Bible teaches that everybody is ungodly. See, everybody, that's... That's who Christ died for, see, in Romans 5, 6, for ungodly people. He didn't die for good people. He died for ungodly uh, people. And then uh, um, as you look down in Romans 5 and verse 8, it says, For God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet, see, and you have a third word here, and it says sinners. See, we're all sinners in the sight of God. See, what we're saying, this is why we need to be reconciled to God. Because every person is a sinner. There's no one who is not a sinner in need of salvation. There's nobody like that. See, we have that famous verse. It's quoted. Everybody knows it. And it says here that, uh, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, in other words, see, we have all failed to come up to God's standard. See, we have all missed the mark, and that is why everybody is a sinner, and that's why everybody needs to be saved. See, there's nobody can say, I'm not a sinner, and therefore I don't need to be uh, saved or reconciled to God. Again, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners unto uh, repentance. Now, 
And that word sinners uh, simply has to do with the matter of missing the mark. See, uh, everybody has missed the mark. There's nobody perfect. There's nobody that, um, uh, that can attain God's, you see, standard. There's nobody in the world that ever could uh, attain God's standard. Why? Because we're all sinners. That's why we can't uh, attain God's standard. We've all missed the mark. They say, now what? Well, what we're talking about is the doctrine of, uh, of reconciliation. See, and nobody can be reconciled to God unless they realize they're a sinner. Amen? See, if I don't realize I'm a sinner in need of reconcil reconciliation to God, then, you see, the Bible teaches I can't be saved. I mentioned John Moore and the uh, burdens are lifted at Calvary song. And he mentioned that when he was in the British Isles and he pastored there in Scotland for a while, and he was um, invited to come to a castle. And um, they had a big event going on. And so he said that, in fact, I think he gave the illustration when he was here. Uh, he said that, that uh, they had this archery competition at this castle. And it was a very prestigious thing. And they heard about John Moore and I guess heard about his song, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. And so they invited him to come to this uh, very uh, ornate and uh, 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 festival at this, ca uh, at this castle. And they had the archery competition. And when they'd shoot the arrow at the target, and when the arrow did not hit the target, say, the, the official would yell out, sinner, sinner, sinner. See, when they missed the target, see, this official would, would yell out the word sinner. And uh, you see, what does all that all go back to? You see, God's standard is perfection. See, nobody hits God's standard of perfection, and because of that, everybody is a sinner. But that's what the word he said they used um, at that festival when you miss the target. You, you're a sinner. You've sinned. You say, you, you, it's a sinner. You miss the target. Now, uh, you say, everybody, according to the Bible, is a sinner, and that's where salvation begins. Now, when somebody says, oh, I, I'm good, I don't need to be saved. Now, as uh, we study the Bible over and over again, say the, the good guy came to Jesus <clears throat> and he didn't get, get saved. And the bad man came to Jesus and he <clears throat> confessed that he was a sinner. And the Bible says that man went down to his house uh, justified. So the Bible says we are sinners. Now, another, the fourth thing you see in Romans chapter 5 is found in verse 10, and it says, For if when we were enemies, now this is all in the same paragraph. This is pretty heavy stuff. You see, uh, that now he says, When we were enemies, you see, in Romans 5, verse 10, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So now, see, the fourth thing he says here, see, we were enemies in the sight of God. Now, now, that's hard to take, and I, I challenge you, that's not Pastor Gent, that's the Bible, that's the Word of God. And it says, when we were, you see, enemies, we were reconciled to God. See, we were God's enemies. We are the enemies of God. Now, that's hard to take, but that's what the Bible says, every unsaved person is the enemy of God. Say, what's wrong with the world? What's wrong with going on in Russia and the Middle East and all around the world? Say, man is the enemy of God. Say, the Bible does not teach we're on neutral ground. Say, the Bible teaches we're not uh, passive when it comes to this matter of um, being uh, an enemy of God. You see, we are all in rebellion against God. Now, in one way or another, that's what the Bible teaches. Now you say, well, pastor, I don't know about that, that Romans. See, see, look what it says here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. For if when we were enemies, see, we're enemies, and then we're reconciled to God by the death of his son. See, we were the enemies of God. So you say, well, pastor, I've never seen that verse in the Bible. I've never heard anybody tell me I'm the enemy of God. Well, uh, turn to Colossians chapter 1. 
Now, turn over to Colossians chapter uh, 1 and look here at verse 21. Galatians, if, uh, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. And the Bible says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies. Enemies. That's the Bible. That's not Pastor Gent. See, that's the Bible. See, we're enemies of God. See, and it says, and, uh, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. He now, see, we're talking about reconciliation. He re who uh, does God reconcile to himself? Those who are his enemies. And that's mentioned, see, throughout the word of God. See, we are the enemies of God. And that's clear. Say, every unsaved person is the enemy of God. In other words, what's the real problem uh, in your life and in my life? What's the real problem in the world today? People are the enemies of God. They're not only ungodly, they are God's enemies. Say, and before we were saved, we were the enemies of God. Say, we were not passive. Uh, we're not neutral. We did wrong. We sinned. And most of the time... Before we were saved, when we sinned, we knew we had sinned. We knew we had sinned against God. We knew we were in rebellion against God, maybe even indirectly, but in our hearts, uh, we knew that. And so the Bible teaches, see, we're enemies. That's why we need to be reconciled to God. Say, we are not only sinners, but we are enemies of God. Now, as you look in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, see, you have a fifth word that is used here to describe all of us before we got saved and uh, that helps us understand why we need to be reconciled to God. Now, in Romans chapter 5 and in verse 9, it says, much more being now justified, you see, by his blood, it's always in the blood, that's the basis of it, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Isn't that interesting as you study the word of God? Say, what are we saved from? We're saved from the wrath of God. We're saved from the judgment of God upon our sin. You see, as we read here in uh, Romans chapter 5, and verse 9, we shall be saved from wrath. From the wrath of God through him. That famous chapter in the Bible on salvation, John chapter 3. And a lot of people never read it, never study what goes on before John 3.16, what goes on after John 3.16, and they never study the chapter. Because see, in uh, John chapter 3 and in verse 36, the Bible says that any person who does not believe, and that literally the verse says... Do not obey Jesus Christ are under the wrath of God. That's what John 3.36 says, the great salvation um, chapter, John 3.16. See, they're under uh, the wrath of God abideth on them. Now, you see, and that's why the Bible teaches very clearly, everybody needs to be reconciled. To God. See, nobody is in a right relationship with God. The most uh, uh, religious, good, outstanding person is still uh, needs to be reconciled to God and is not in a right relationship uh, with God. See, now, the Bible says, number one, say we're without strength to save ourselves. Nobody has the strength, the ability to save themselves. That's why I need to be reconciled to God. Number two, the Bible says every person is ungodly. That's, and that's why we need to be reconciled to God, because we are ungodly. Number three, the Bible says, now not Pastor Gent, the Bible says every unsaved person is the enemy of God. That's the Bible. See, and that's why the Bible says we need to be reconciled to God. Why? We're not in a right relationship with God. See, we are, we are the enemies of God. And that's uh, very clear as you read Romans chapter uh, uh, 5. And then the Bible says, see, we're the objects 
of the wrath of God. Now, that is not popular. That is not preached hardly in any place in America today. You see, Romans chapter 5, that we are the enemies of God, we're sinners, we're ungodly, we're without strength, and because of that, we are the object of God's wrath. See, now that's the Bible. Now, now what we're talking about, see, is the Bible doctrine of reconciliation. You see, how man can be brought into a right relationship with God. Now, you see the clear teaching of the Bible as well as the clear teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very, very uh, clear. See, man is under the wrath of God. He's the enemy. Uh, he's a sinner. See, everybody needs the Lord. Nobody is right with the Lord. Uh, nobody is saved in their own uh, strength and in their own way because, see, we're alienated. We are sinners in the sight of of God Almighty. Now, you say, how can a sinner and an ungodly person be reconciled to God? And that's the scripture that we read this morning as you turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and you read here in verse 20. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, Though God did beseech. Now, you have the word you there in your Bible. Now, in the King James Bible. Now, as someone ha has brought out, an outstanding Bible teacher, and I agree with him. He said, whenever you have a word in, that's italicized in your Bible, you need to cross it out because that's man's interpretation. It's not translation. It's interpretation, see? And so, and, and the Bible teacher that I'm thinking of, he said, whenever you cross out those words uh, that are italicized in your Bible, which is the reason why they italicize them, because they're not in the original, and they wanted everybody to know that they're not in the original, that it was interpretation rather than uh, uh, translation, because he said, usually, when you eliminate those words, then the verse makes more sense. Makes a lot more sense when you eliminate them. Now, here in Romans uh, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he's saying, Now, when we, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech. No, he's not saying you. He's writing to Christians, he's writing to the church at Corinth. He's not saying you need to be reconciled to God. Say, and um, he says, We pray you. Now, again, he's not referring to the church at uh, Corinth. Say, it's not in the original. Uh, and he says, Pray. Uh, in Christ said, be ye reconciled to God. Say, and what do we learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is that God is begging people to be reconciled to him. He's begging people. Say, he's beseeching people. He's exhorting people to be reconciled to him. Why? He wants them to be reconciled unto him. Now, um, now how exactly can a person who is alienated from God, separated from God, the enemy of God, um, the under the wrath of God, be reconciled to God, be brought into a right relationship with God uh, Almighty? Now, the Bible tells us very clearly. Now, for instance, in, uh, you look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. It says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, by Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the basis of reconciliation. Nobody can be reconciled to God apart from the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. And that's very clearly. Now, in Romans chapter um, 5 and verse 10, it says we are reconciled to God through the death of his son. Now, that's the cross. It's only through the cross the blood of Christ that a person can be reconciled uh, to God. And then in Ephesians 2.16, it says we're reconciled by the cross. Say, by the cross. And then in uh, Colossians 1.20, it's through the blood of the cross. So, you see, the Bible is crystal clear when it comes to the matter of how can I who am estranged and separated from God, the enemy of God, 
uh, an ungodly person. I don't have any strength at all to save myself to be reconciled to God. See, Jesus Christ performed the work of reconciliation on the cross of Calvary. See, the Bible says it was through the death of his son. It's through his blood. That's the way we are reconciled uh, to God. Now, when you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you have the basis and the explanation of how an enemy of God, how a, a sinner, how somebody without strength to save themselves can be reconciled to God and brought into a perfect relationship with God. Now, um, look here in verse 19. See, uh, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now, verse 21 explains how it's all, uh, how it all comes about. Now, again, many have said they believe that this is, Romans 5, 21, certainly one of, if not, the greatest verse in all the Bible. In all the Bible. Now, that's what many have said. Now, uh, and, and I believe that it's certainly one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Now, what does uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 uh, say? Now, he says, for he, God, made him to be sin for us. Now, what does that say? Jesus Christ was made sin for us. Now, you see, the word there, uh, made, is the uh, once for all action. There is one time that Jesus Christ was made sin for mankind, where he became sin. See what it says in Romans 5.21. The greatest verse, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. He hath made, see, that one time, him to be sin for us. And that's very clear as you study the Bible. There was one time when God the Father placed the sin of the world upon Jesus Christ. And that was at the cross. Wasn't that his birth? Wasn't that his resurrection? Wasn't when he did his miracles? But it was on the cross. See, that was one time when he took the sin of the world upon himself. Like the Bible says, he's not only the propitiation for our sins, but what does the Bible say in 1 John? The sins of the whole world, say, were laid upon uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says you have the word here, that. Now, the word that is an important word especially when you're studying Bible doctrine. Because the word that, most of all the time uh, in the Bible, is a purpose clause. See, it introduces a purpose. Now, in our English language, we read something that, and it doesn't register, it doesn't mean much to us. But see, it's a purpose clause. Now, why did Jesus Christ have to die for the sin of the world, for your sin? and my sin, and the sins of the world. Why? You see, this gives a purpose. See, that, uh, the Bible says, that we might be made. Now, again, uh, you have the purpose clause, but then you have the word made, literally the word become. And you see, again, that is a completed action. See, it's, a, it's something that's done once for all. Just like Jesus Christ died for our sins once for all. Now, the Bible says, of course, he knew no sin, that the purpose of his death on the cross of Calvary, that we might be made, you see, the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Now, we might be made just as righteous as God. Nobody goes to heaven. Nobody is saved unless they are as righteous as God. Why? God cannot look upon sin, amen? So he cannot, can God let somebody in heaven say, well, you know, you were a pretty good guy. I mean, you, you were better than most people. So No, see, God is a holy God. See, when you get into Bible doctrine, you get into the great truths of the Bible. 
which are clearly enunciated and, and brought out in the Bible. Say, God is a holy God. Everybody has missed the mark. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you say, how can I get to heaven? Say, I need to be as righteous as God. Now, see, that gets you into the Bible doctrine of imputation. You see, now, when you study the Bible, for instance, like as you uh, read here uh, in Romans 5, in verse uh, 18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself uh, by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of re reconcil reconciliation, to wit, say, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Say, that is why Jesus Christ came into the world so that the world might be reconciled to him, so that people might be saved. They might be forgiven and go to heaven someday. But now, you see what it says in verse 19? Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now, now we get into the Bible doctrine. Say, not imputing their trespasses unto them. You see, that's an amazing thing when you study the Bible. See, when a person really gets saved, see, our sins are no longer imputed to us. God can't see them. They're gone. That's what forgiveness, uh, Bible doctrine of forgiveness, uh, is all about. See, and of course, everybody studies out, they know. See, that's an accounting term. You see, the, you put down in the account book, you know, you, the uh, person owes so much or they paid this and the other thing. And But now, see, they're not imputed unto us. Say, you're clean in the sight of God if you're saved. Now, that's hard to believe, but that's the Bible. That's the Word of God. Say, and that's why we ought to live for him, amen, because of what he did for us. But say, they're not imputed unto us. But what is given to our account? What is imputed unto us is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Say, by the way, that's the Bible doctrine of imputation. Say, our sin was imputed to Christ. God does not impute our sin to us anymore, but his righteousness is imputed, given, put on our account. So you see, it says that we, verse 21, again, could be the greatest verse in the Bible. By the way, I think that's a great verse for anybody that dealing with an unsaved person. If you're ever dealing with an unsaved person, you're witnessing, always bring out 2 Corinthians 5.21. Why? Because that's the heart of the gospel. See, Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself. See, uh, our sin was imputed to him on the cross. And now we might be made the righteousness of God, but it's only through him. See, it's only through Jesus Christ. Say, oh, I'm a righteous person. No, you're not. Nobody's righteous. The only righteousness that any of us have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is perfect. Only perfect people go to heaven. See, that gets us into the Bible doctrine of justification. What does the Bible doctrine of justification teach? Everybody has heard about that. And what is the Bible doctrine of justification? See, God looks upon us as if we've never sinned. We are justified in the sight of God. Now, now that's hard to get a hold of, you see. But that's our position through Jesus Christ. That's our position because we're in Christ. Now, again, as I mentioned many times, there's not a lot of gospel preaching in the world today, and especially in America. See, there's not a lot of true Bible preaching about Bible salvation. So this is the, the great work. Now, um, and in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, say, God is begging you to be reconciled to God. This morning, he's begging, he's pleading, he's exhorting. Be reconciled to God. See what it says in verse 20. It says, and now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech. Now, again, the word you is not in there. 
by us. God is begging people today through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be reconciled to God. See what it says in verse 20. We pray you. What's that word? Uh, again, you is in italicized. But he says we pray. What's that mean? We're begging. We're exhorting. We're pleading. That's what the verse is, uh, means. Say, uh, we're begging, pleading, exhorting you. You see, and what's it say? In Christ's stead, as if Jesus Christ were here this morning in this pulpit. You see what it says in verse 20? Uh, you say, in Christ's stead... Be reconciled to God. Your greatest need is you're a sinner. You're an ungodly, we're all ungodly, wicked sinners in the sight of God. I cannot save myself. You cannot save, nobody can save themselves. But Jesus died so I might be saved. I might come to him uh, and be reconciled to God. You see, that's uh, this great doctrine of Bible reconciliation. Now, you say, Pastor, that's hard to believe. That I know my heart. I know I am a sinner. But you see, through Jesus Christ, his blood, what he did for me on the cross, I can be as righteous as God. And yes, that's the only way you can go to heaven. That's what being saved is all about. Say, your sins are not imputed to you anymore. Say, uh, they're forgiven. See, and that's the position we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, because it's such an exalted position, Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 6 when uh, people say, well, Paul, if you're preaching this great salvation, does that mean that uh, we should abound in sin then? Does it mean that we should go and, and live any way we want? And Paul answers that, and he says, absolutely no. Because if you have a new master, and your master is Jesus Christ, you will want to serve him, and you will not want to continue in sin. So it's not that, sin may, that grace may abound, you see, but it's close when people don't understand it. See, this is a, a tremendous doctrine, and only the Holy Spirit can cause somebody to get a hold of it. But now... You see, the wonderful thing the Bible teaches is that if you and I have been reconciled to God, now, you see, what does that mean? I just go my way, I live my life, and, you know, uh, I'm not a concerned person. Now, you see, what this passage in 2 Corinthians 5 brings out very, very clearly is that if you have been reconciled to God by the blood of Jesus Christ, now you have the most important work in all the world to do the most important thing in all the world. See, and that is to help people be reconciled to God. To encourage people. See, see what it says here, as you read here in uh, verse 19. It says, to know or to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, not the angels, not a vision, unto us, the ministry of reconciliation. See what it says. See, he's writing to the church there. And hath committed unto us. You see, the word of reconciliation. Now, if you have been reconciled to God, if I have been reconciled to God, I can now be involved in the most important work in all the world. Now, a lot of times people say, well, I want a ministry, I want to be involved in things, and, and um, a lot of times it's certainly not biblical, <laughs> sometimes not even ethical, and uh, so forth. But see, here's something the Bible teaches. Every child of God, every child, he's writing to church at Corinth, he said, every child of God ought to be involved in the most important work in all the world, and that is, we have the word of reconciliation. Everybody ought to be a witness for Jesus. Not some, not only women, not only men. Everybody who's saved. If we have this great position in Christ where we've been reconciled to him, we all ought to be ambassadors 
for Jesus Christ, which simply means you ought to be a witness for him. See, as it says here in verse 19, and hath committed unto us, say unto us, Christians, believers, the word of reconciliation. See, we ought to encourage people to be reconciled to God so that they might be saved. Now, look what the next verse says. See, in other words, when you get saved, that's just the beginning, amen? God has a work for you to do and me to do, and this is for every child. He's not talking to pastors here. He's not talking to missionaries. See, that's why uh, I have a hard time. See, a lot of times people preach verses like this about missionaries and about pastors. See, that's not what it's talking about at all. See, this is written to a church. It's written to believers, uh, everyday believers like you, like me. It's not written to missionaries, not written to uh, pastors. Now, in verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Now, who is the we? He's writing to the church. Paul's saying, I'm an ambassador, but just as much as I am an ambassador or a witness for Christ, so are you. See, that's our job in the world. That's your job. That's your mean job. And then the Bible says here, as though God did beseech by us. The only mouth that Jesus Christ has in the world today is your mouth. He's not here. I heard about somebody and they said, oh, I saw Jesus Christ. I was walking out in the lake and I saw Jesus Christ. No, he didn't see Jesus Christ. He, uh, I don't know what he saw, but he did not see Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father today. He's interceding for us. See, he is not, Jesus Christ is not in the world, anywhere in the world today, preaching the doctrine of reconciliation or the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is not here. See what the verse says? Uh, Though God did beseech by us. See, the only mouthpiece God has in the world today is your mouthpiece. If anybody's going to be one to Christ, it's through your witnessing. And that's not, and who's he talking? He's talking to the church. He's talking to men, women, those who are saved. See, and um, in verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech, again, by us. That's the only way God reconciles sinners to himself, saves people. He says, we pray, and again, that's not talking about just praying. That's not the word for prayer. See, we're exhorting. We're pleading. Okay? What does it, verse 20 say? We are pleading uh, you. Now, again, cross that out. See, it's not in there. In, we pleading in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. See, we are in the place of Jesus Christ. Now, see, that's... The wonder of the Bible. Isn't it something how we've gotten away from the wonder of the Bible? Now, what I mean by that, say you and I are God's representatives upon earth. He's not here. He ascended up into heaven. The only mouth Jesus Christ has is your mouth, my mouth. And he's not talking here about preachers and missionaries. He's talking the church at Corinth. So see, that's the wonderful application of the doctrine of reconciliation. It's all done by Jesus Christ when he took my sin on the cross and he died for my sin. And when I accept him, he gives me his righteousness and I am as righteous as God. That's the only way I can go to heaven. For instance... Uh, let me just flesh it out a minute. You say, someday we all know in our hearts we're going to stand before God. Someday. But suppose uh, you stood before God and you said, well, Lord, I'm here because I did the best I could. Now, I'm not here on the blood of Christ and through being converted and saved, but uh, the best I could. Or somebody says, Lord, uh, I believe you should let me into heaven because I've been a good person. 
or been a good Catholic or a good Baptist or a good Presbyterian. And you see, no one gets to heaven unless they are as perfect as Jesus Christ. See, and that is a gift. By the way, Romans tells us it's a gift of righteousness. It's a gift that God gives us. Now, what we're talking about, the wonder of the Bible. If you've been reconciled to God, isn't this a tremendous thing to encourage us? We now, who have been reconciled to God, are the very mouthpiece of Jesus Christ in this world to help sinners come to salvation. Man, that's fantastic, amen? I mean, that is the greatest work in all the world, amen? And uh, again, I, I mentioned that I don't care who you are, what job you have, rich, poor, no matter where you live in the world, say that's the greatest job in all the world. And I'm reminded, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, of that student down at Princeton University. And he's a goalie for the hockey team. And... Uh, when you go to Princeton, you have to do your homework, you have to study, and you do a lot of studying, and you're a student there. And, uh, but this fella is saved. And on his helmet, in clear letters, he has John 3, 16 on his helmet. Now, and then number two, he has in clear letters, Romans 8, 18. You see that? That verse that says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory. And then he has the other verse from the 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. By the way, that's a pretty good way to stand up for Christ. He has that on his helmet so everybody could see it. Now he's a student at Princeton. He does homework. He's in, you know, all these difficult classes and so forth. But now why would he do that? Because he's a Christian. And he realizes that he has the responsibility, even though he's a student at Princeton University, to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Amen? And I don't care if you're, if you're a student at Princeton, you're a truck driver, you're a carpenter, you're a millionaire, you're the poorest, or you're the richest. Everybody who is saved, you are the mouthpiece of God in the world to help people get saved. That is glorious, amen? See, that gives purpose in life. That gives meaning in life. And uh, you say, oh, pastor, uh, how do I get started? Well, just uh, get started. That's the thing, just do it. Uh, talk to your friends. Invite people to church. Take your stand. Like that, that, that goalie on the hockey team. See, why does he do that? He wants everybody to know he's a Christian. He wants everybody to know that Jesus Christ is first place in my life. Uh, uh, my uh, student um, involvement is second, Jesus is first. And I'm sure he's a good student. He's probably an honor student. He's probably one of the highest IQs in uh, college students in America. But you see, Christ should be first. No matter where you are, no matter uh, who you are, Jesus seek ye first the kingdom of God. Say we're all responsible to take, a, take the, the Great Commission. Now, see, that's the doctrine of reconciliation. We're sinners. The only way to be brought into right relationship with Christ is through the blood of Christ. But what a glorious application. We are the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ in the world today to help people be reconciled to God. See what it says in verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you. Now again, the you is italicized. Uh, he beseeches by us. How does God reach out to the lost sinner? Through you. And there's no other way to do it. Through me. Now that's why every Christian should be a witness for Jesus Christ. If for no other reason, because of the doctrine of reconciliation, what the Bible clearly teaches. We didn't even scratch on the Great Commission, amen? Go in all the world, preach the gospel, that's for everybody. See, so many times people have applied these great truths, see, to preachers and missionaries. 
See, that's not, that's not, has nothing to do with that. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. See, we, all of God's children, should be involved in this great work. And I believe that's, now, one of the ways to grow in Christ. Now, I don't think I've ever read a book that says one of the ways you grow in Christ by being a witness. But now, if you begin to be a witness for Christ, if you are a witness for Christ, for instance, you uh, witness to your neighbors, your friends, your family, uh, baby step might be inviting them to church or whatever, getting into a spiritual conversation. Or if you ask them, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Uh, that'll get you right into the heart of a good gospel uh, conversation and uh, help us in this area. But no one will ever be a growing Christian unless you're a witnessing Christian. Why? Say, when you witness to the people in the world today, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to check up, well, how are you living? Who are you to tell? See what I mean? It'll help us to grow. And uh, I think one of the greatest things in my life to help me grow as a Christian was being involved in witnessing. When I got saved, I did not know another Christian in the world when I got saved. I didn't know anybody who was a Christian. So I started witnessing to my friends. And uh, it was a wonderful thing because some of them got saved. But here's the thing I want to tell you. That helped me as a new Christian. Now, uh, did anybody teach you how to help somebody come to Christ? Did anybody teach you the Romans road? Did you go through a pro? No, I just got saved. And I knew that my buddies were not saved and they needed to be saved. And but what I'm saying, say that helped me to grow because man, uh, when you start witnessing the people, they'll throw a thousand questions at you and you'll have to study your Bible. You'll have to give them a Bible answer. You'll have to know your Bible. See, and that's one of the, the most dynamic things. If you want to be a dynamic Christian, be a witness for Christ. You say, well, I never did it. Well, you start doing it and you'll start growing. Otherwise, you'll remain a babe all your life. See, we need to be a witness for Christ. But anyway, this is a great Bible doctrine of um, reconciliation. See, we're sinners. We've missed the mark. We're under the wrath of God. Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood so that I might be forgiven of my sins. I can know I'm forgiven of my sins. I can be reconciled to God through his blood that was shed for me. See, that's a great Bible doctrine. Of, and that's what the world needs. That's what's missing in the world. People need to be reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why a lot of these people, I say, well, we have the answers today. And my, my thought is that a lot of times, if you know of their personal lives, you know they don't have any answers. Uh, they're just making money. They don't say, say, the answer is the blood of Christ being reconciled to God. What's wrong? Say, we, uh, we're, we're not reconciled to God, and the only way to be reconciled is through the blood of Christ. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. And as our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, I wonder this morning if there would be somebody here in the Garden State Baptist Church this first Sunday in March, and you would admit that you're a sinner in the sight of God, You'd say, Pastor, if I died today, I don't have the assurance I'd go to heaven. Pastor, would you pray for me? Pastor, I want to be reconciled to God. I want to know my sins have been forgiven. And would you please pray for me? And you'd lift your hand. And by lifting your hand, you're simply saying, Pastor, would you pray for me? I do want to be reconciled to God. I don't think I've been reconciled to God. I cannot say, if I died today... I'd go to heaven. Pastor, I realize this morning through the preaching of the word of God that the thing that's missing in my life is I'm not reconciled to God. 
and I want to be reconciled to God. You would raise your hand. Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Remember me in prayer. And then you see the practical application of all of this is really dynamic, life-changing, transforming. You are the mouthpiece for Jesus Christ in this world today. You say, Pastor, but I don't know anything. I'm just a little old me. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a missionary. I'm a no, you, according to the Bible, are the mouthpiece for Jesus Christ in the world today. And if your buddies and your circle don't hear about Jesus Christ, that's because of you. You are the mouthpiece of Jesus. Yeah, say, we're all ambassadors for Christ. Everybody. That's a great thrill of the Christian life. That, that's a dynamic. Start getting involved in telling people about Jesus, and you'll be growing and developing spiritually uh, in your lives. Our Father, we pray you to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we turn to page 131, and let's sing together, Jesus paid it all. Not some of it, but man, he paid it all on the cross. Let's sing about it. Now, if you're not saved... If you're not sure you're saved, you say, Pastor, I cannot say if I died today, I'd go to heaven. You'd say, Pastor, I cannot say I know that my sins are forgiven. And uh, you want to get that settled. Now, if you heard through the uh, uh, interpretation, uh, if you're here for the first time, you've been here many times, but you need to come, I'd encourage you to come. And uh, by your coming, you're saying, I want to be reconciled to God. I know I'm a sinner, and I do. The best way I know how, I'm coming as a sinner to be reconciled to God. Let's sing it together. One